We want to turn to Isaiah chapter 44. We're going to look at this. It's a section of scripture not, uh, not, not real familiar with, and that presents a problem when we come to the New Testament, that there's so much of the language of the New Testament that draws on things of the old. And if we would spend more time in these prophets, which I intend to keep bringing lessons from the prophets on somewhat of a regular basis as we go, we'll learn this language. And then when we come across that language in the New Testament, it'll give us a whole framework for helping us understand what these expressions and these words mean. And we're going to look at this idea of the first and the last. Jesus says, I am the first and the last. He says it in the book of Revelation. That itself is a very difficult book. We're so unfamiliar with some of those expressions, but if we understood better the prophets, when we come to the book of Revelation, we will see things, oh, I recognize that. That, that came before. I understand the context of this, and then that'll help us understand what Revelation's talking about. Let me show you. Revelation 1 and verse 11. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Have you seen any of these uh, pulpits that have engraved, kind of like it says this do in remembrance of me here, but sometimes it'll have a little Greek symbols here on the, the pulpit. And the, the two letters, it's Alpha and Omega. It's the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Well, if we put this in English, what does that mean? I'm A and Z. That's what they're talking about. I'm everything there is from A to Z. And sometimes we'll, when we want to cover something completely, so we're going to talk about that from A to Z. We're going to cover all of it. Well, that's what Jesus means when he says I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Revelation 1, 17 through 19. He laid his right hand on me, saying, fear not. He's talking about John. Jesus appears to John, and, it, and certainly if that were to happen to us, we would be frightened. And he puts his hand on him and said, John, fear not. I'm the first and the last. But then he says this. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The, the book of Revelation is written signifying things that would shortly come to pass. Talking about the first. How do you know this is going to come to pass? I'm the first and the last. I know all things. I know everything that led up to this. I'm aware of everything happening now. And I know what's going to happen. That's the significance of the first and the last. Revelation 2 and verse 8. These things, saith the first and the last. And then Revelation 22 and verse 13. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The first and the last. He's omnipresent in time. You know what omnipresent means? That's he's everywhere. And we think of everywhere here, but he's everywhere in time. And so he's omniscient in understanding. He knows what's happened. He knows what's happening. And he knows what will happen. Well, that's the way the word is used in the book of Isaiah. And if we're familiar with Isaiah and came across this in Revelation, <coughs> we'd see it <clears throat> three times in Isaiah. Isaiah 41 and verse 4. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and the last, I am he. Revelation 48 and verse 12. 
Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he, the first and the last. You can listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. I'm the first and the last. And then the text we're going to be looking at, Isaiah 44, 6 through 7. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who as I shall call and shall declare it. Who else can do that? Who else can say, this is the way it will be, and it will be that way. No one else can do that but the Lord. And then he says, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people. And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. You think you know what's going to happen in the past? You just tell it. You try this. And you'll see how you don't know. But I know. Because I'm the first and the last. Okay, let me remind you so we don't forget. This latter part of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is writing a scroll. It's going to be read in a hundred years. Because a hundred years later, the children of Israel are going to be in captivity. And they need to know that God has not forgotten them. That God still has plans for them. And he's going to redeem them and bring them home. And through them, he'll accomplish his will. So Isaiah is writing to generations that are to come. And while they're in Babylon, they'll unroll the scroll and read the words of Isaiah, and it'll give them hope. Let's start in Isaiah chapter 44. Here, not, yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. You've heard about God's chosen people? You've heard that the, the Jews are God's chosen people. Israel's God's chosen people. It's Verses like this, where we get that expression, he has chosen them. Why has he chosen Israel? Did he choose Israel for eternal salvation regardless of how they lived or what they did? No, that's not, that's not what he's talking about. He chose this nation because through this people Israel, beginning all the way back with Abraham and all the way into the time of Christ, He's going to work with these people to bring his great plan into all the earth. And now we're beneficiaries of that. So he's letting Israel know, I'm not through with you. Israel, whom I have chosen, that's set the Lord that made thee. I want you to notice this. We're going to be talking about idols. See, men make idols. But God says, but I made you. He says, I form thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Jeshurun. Sometimes you'll find that Jeshurun. It's a, with a, a S-H. This is Jeshurun. There's a J-S-H-U-Run in the Bible. Same little word, just spelt a little different. It's kind of like a nickname, for Jerusalem and the inhabitants. It means the little righteous one. And so I've chosen you, Jacob, thou little righteous one, the one whom I've chosen. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass and as willows by the watercourses. One shall say, I'm the Lord's. Another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. Another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. You're going to be able to identify with me. You're going to be glad you're one of my people. You're glad I'm chosen. You'll, you'll call your names after me and says, that's who I am. I'm with the Lord. I'm with Israel and with Jacob. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel. Here we are. And his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I'm the first, I'm the last. And besides me, there is no God. 
And who is I shall call and declare it and set it in order for me since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come. Let them show unto them, fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. There is there a God besides me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. And then Isaiah is going to talk about the idols. The Israelites came into the land of Canaan and it was a people given to idolatry. They'd go out and they'd cut down a tree. And then they'd take that tree and carve it up and make themselves a god. Now they'd have to prop it up so it doesn't fall down. And they'd bow down and worship a god that they had made. And then they'll take the rest of that tree and they'll use it to warm themselves by the fire and cook their bread. How could that be a god of anything that you made like that? And he's going to ridicule this idolatry. Before the Babylonian captivity, Israel would be swayed away from the worship of Jehovah to worship idols like that. After the Babylonian captivity, they never turned to idols again. In fact, idolatry was something unheard of among the Israelites all the way up until the time of Christ. They turned from it. Part of that's because of this teaching that Isaiah is giving them and the experience they went through. He said, they make a graven image. All of them vanity. That means there's nothing to it. They make a grave and I, there's nothing to that. And their delectable things shall not profit. And they that are their own witnesses, they see not nor know that they may be ashamed. Who have formed a God or are molded a graven image that is profitable for nothing? Behold, Isaiah 44, 11, behold, all his followers shall be ashamed. And the workmen, now we're going to talk about the workmen, those who put these idols together. They're men. They're men making gods. The workmen, they are men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear and they shall be ashamed together. The smith, that's one of the workmen. Think of the blacksmith, the one that works in the metal. He's going to be making a god. The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals and fashion it with the hammers and worketh it with the strength of his arms. But what happens? Well, he gets hungry and his strength faileth and he drinks no water and he's faint. And he's going to make a God. The carpenter, here's the one that works with the wood. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule, he marketh it out with a line, he fitteth it with planes, and he maketh out with a compass, and maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in his house. Look at all of the, the technology they're using here with the rule and the line and the planes and the compass, putting all this together to make an idol. He heweth down cedars. It mentions four kinds of trees here, four kinds of wood. He heweth down cedars, taketh the cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth the ash, the rain dust nourish it. Then shall it be for the man to burn. For he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god and worshipeth it. He maketh a graven image and falleth down thereto. The same wood he uses to, to put in his fire, that's the same wood he's using to make a god. He burneth part thereof in the fire. And with part thereof he eateth flesh. He roasteth roast and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself and says, Ah, I'm warm. I've seen the fire. And the residue thereof he maketh a god. Even his graven image. He falleth down to it and worshipeth it and prayeth unto it and saith, Deliver me for thou art my god. They have not known nor understood. Verse 18. 
For he hath shut their eyes, they cannot see, and their hearts they cannot understand, and unconsider in his heart. Neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I burn part in the fire, yea, and I break bread upon the coals thereof. I roasted flesh and eat it, and I shall make the residue thereof an abomination. I fall down to the stock of a tree. They don't even realize how foolish they have become in trying to make their own gods. He feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul nor say, is that not a lie in my right hand? And now contrast this with the Lord, the real God. And so Isaiah 44, 21 Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. You see, they made their gods, but I made you. Thou art my servant, O Israel, and thou shalt not be forgotten of me. What words of comfort and assurance in that captivity. He says, I blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins returned unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth, break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein, for the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, stretcheth forth the heavens alone, spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars, that's these false prophets, these, these false priests of these false gods, they're liars. He frustrates the tokens of the liars. They use these tokens to try to figure out like a Ouija board, or figure out what's going to happen, what's going to come to pass. He frustrates that. He says, he maketh diviners mad. Those are the ones that, oh, I'll see into the future. I'll tell your fortune. He, he lets you know. He, he, he frustrates their idea, makes them mad. He turneth wise men backwards and makes their knowledge foolish that confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited. And to the cities of Judah, ye shall be built. And I will raise up the decayed places thereof that saith to the deep, Be dry, and I'll dry up thy rivers. Nebuchadnezzar had come through destroying their cities and villages and laid Jerusalem waste. But they'd read their scroll from Isaiah. God's promise, you're going to live in Jerusalem again. Jerusalem will be inhabited again and you'll build it back again. And then we read this. That Seth of Cyrus he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure even saying to Jerusalem thou shalt be built into the temple thy foundation shall be laid <coughs> Cyrus Cyrus was of the Medes and the Persians he wasn't of Babylon but Cyrus would rise up and would exert great power and Cyrus would overwhelm the city of Babylon and that kingdom over which Babylon ruled and there'd be the rule of the Medes and the Persians which would stretch from Macedonia all the way into India. Cyrus would bring this about. But what Isaiah is talking about, this King Cyrus... It's going to happen in 170 years from the time Isaiah spoke. 170 years ago. 
Do you know who was president of the United States 170 years ago? Now that was, uh, let me give you a hint, 1854. 1854. Have any idea? If I told you, you may not know. Pierce, that's close. Millard Fillmore. Okay, Millard Fillmore. You remember Millard Fillmore, don't you? Probably not. <laughs> he did raise to pacify things and hold off the, the coming of the Civil War. In seven years, the nation would go through this bloody Civil War and things would be so unturned. No one had ever heard of Abraham Lincoln. If they told you in Millard Fillmore's day, well, there's going to be this young lawyer in Illinois, Abraham Lincoln, he'll be elected president. No one would have, how would anybody know that? What if you found a newspaper while Millard Fillmore's president, somewhere in the archives, they pull out a newspaper and it says, in the year 2024, there's going to be election and the one that's going to be voted to be president will be and then give that name. I'm not going to give that name because I don't know. Even this close, I can't tell you who's going to be elected. What if it said that in that paper and then come to find out yeah, that's who was elected and that person hadn't even been born yet? 1854. That's what Isaiah is doing. 170 years later. Cyrus is going to say to the Jews in Babylon, you can go home and build your city and build your temple. I'll open up my treasures to help you do that. The first and the last knew this, didn't he? He was the first and the last. Let's go to the next chapter just a little bit. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, that word anointed is translated in the New Testament. It's the word Christ, Cyrus. Well, he's anointed because God had anointed him for this role, not because he was going to be the Messiah of the world. But thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leave gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by name, and the God of Israel. That's what he's going to do for Cyrus. Verse 4 and 5. For Jacob my servant's sake. And for Israel mine elect. I have called thee by name. I have surnamed thee. Though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord. And there is none else. There is no God beside me. None of the idols that the men had made could do anything like this. There wasn't anything to it. But God could. He's the first and the last. I call it, and that's the way it's going to be. And I've not forgotten you, Israel. Revelation 1, 17 through 19. John is now writing to the Early churches, they're going to go through some tough times of persecutions, either from the Jews or from the Romans or from wherever, these churches. But God has not forgotten his churches. They'll come through this time and they'll be established. So he laid his right hand upon me saying, fear not, I'm the first and the last. I'm he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Here's the comfort we can get from this. You remember how he told Israel, I've known thee 
from the womb. I made thee. God, God knew us from the womb. He knew us before we knew ourselves. He knew us before our mamas knew we were coming. He formed us. He made us. He loves us. He hasn't forgotten us. He tells us in his word, I've got plans for you. You be faithful to me. And it'll come to pass. And I'll redeem you to myself. And we can have confidence in what God says. Because he's the first and the last. And he knows. There's great comfort to receive as we get into this and study. This is the same God we worship and serve today. Now we need to be in Christ. All the promises that God made for eternity are for those in Christ. So you need to be baptized into Christ and live in him and walk through this life with all the unknowns ahead of us. God already knows. And he'll be with us. If you need to respond to the invitation, then do it while we stand inside.